right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, really happy to be joined uh, live here today and in the recording by so many wonderful people. Uh, this is the 225th uh, Scientific Governance and Risk Call here at MakerDAO. My name is Peyton. I go by Pros11 Online, and I'm one of our governance facilitators here, joined by a bunch of awesome people that uh, either contribute or are generally interested in the Maker Protocol. And this is our uh, weekly meeting where we talk shop, uh, try to go over what's happening both on the governance side and on the risk side uh, that the protocol and the DAO should be aware of. A uh, few quick ground rules to go over just to make sure we have a good meeting today. Uh, let's try to avoid talking over each other. We have uh, reactions provided by Zoom, which make our lives a little bit easier. So if you want to express some sentiment, you can use it there. Uh, it's also really helpful if you want to join our speakers list. You can find the raised hand button uh, under your reactions in Zoom. That lets me know that, hey, you'd like to uh, say something on the mic when, when it's conversationally appropriate. Uh, otherwise, you can always drop a comment or question in chat, and I'm happy to read it off for you. Uh, main thing is, if you do hop on the mic, try to introduce yourself, let people know who you are and uh, where you're speaking from. And uh, finally, if you have questions, this is an open meeting, so I uh, would really love to uh, get them asked. Okay. Uh, let's speed through the agenda here. Uh, you're probably used to me going over the governor's votes and hearing from the MIP editors on the MIPS. We'll do that as usual. Uh, then we got a cool uh, initiative update on the 2022 uh, financial retrospective uh, from the Strategic Finance Core Unit. Uh, and then for those that want to participate afterwards, we're going to be doing some pregame constitution breakout sessions. So really looking forward to that. Um, but yeah, let's uh, get into it here with our votes. Uh, was a somewhat quiet week on the governance portal, uh, as opposed to the governance forum. Uh, on the portal, we just had two uh, weekly polls. Both of those passed. We had one updating uh, the multi-sig management for that uh, velodrome uh, uh, NFT. But I guess the like way to describe it would be the like uh, funds directing the the bribing uh, voting mechanism. Uh, and then we have the PPG, the Open Market Committee, um, their recent proposal uh, changing a few of the rates uh, did pass as well. Uh, on the executive front, you might have noticed this week's exec uh, has already passed, so that'll be executing, uh, I believe, in a couple days. And then uh, we do not have any planned executive for next week, um, so look for uh, another executive, not next Wednesday, but the following one. With that, I'll kick hand over the mic to uh, one of our MIP editors, uh, Gala, to let you know uh, one or two of the things that have been going on in the forum. Yes, hello everyone. This is Gala. So I'm I'm gonna try to be cool. I hope you like my voice. <laughs> so um, we are in our formal submission uh, period for our February governance cycle. Uh, we have five proposals. Let's take a look at them. Um, for our top level MIPS, there's MIP 95. Uh, so if approved, Cotton Bank will participate 100 million um, of loans to make DAO's existing real world asset master participation trust. We also have two amendments. Um, one to amend the interim facilitator um, onboarding process and one to amend MIP 62 uh, to change the communication responsibilities. And finally, there's one Declaration of intent to implement a future to refund people who lost die by sending it to the die contract and the proposal to restart the MKR burning. So the ratification pulse will go on chain next Monday and will run for two weeks. Now we can dive in our proposals in RSC. As you all know, there had been like a tornado of them this week. Um, so let's start with the top level MIPS uh, first, uh, part one. So um, as we mentioned in our previous calls already, um, we have proposals to onboard real world asset vaults, introduce a defender contract against governance attacks, start utilizing the HAT, uh, the HATS protocol, introduce a new framework to broadcast and manage requests for projects and associated funding, uh, namely MIP 96, 97, and 98. Uh, there's one to offer DAI to C5 to enable real-world use cases, and one to introduce a framework to guide allocations amongst table assets. There's also two new proposals on this the top-level MIPs. So one MIP um, 115, 
um, which is a proposal to diversify makers yield appetite using GDI for revenue generation. And MIP 116, where Phoenix uh, Labs proposes to incorporate D3M to provide DAI liquidity to the Spark protocol. So this is the um, first part of top level MIPS. Next, for our second part, it's the maker constitution and uh, all of the MIPS attached uh, to it. So um, we have MIP 101, which introduces the constitution and 13 other top level MIPS uh, related to it. So MIP 102 uh, redefines the MIPS amendment and removal processes for the purpose, uh, purposes of implementing the end game. It comes with a subproposal already, so it's MIP 102C2 subproposal 1. Um, it amends all the critical MIPs uh, that are needed to support the pregame maker constitution and scope frameworks. So these are MIP, MIPs 0, 16, 24, and 31. Um, and then MIP from MIP 103 to MIP 114, those are all the 12 scope frameworks, namely, yes, I'm going to read them all. So um, the stability and liquidity, the decentralized collateral, the real world asset collateral, the ecosystem scope framework, the protocol engineering scope framework, the growth, the physical resilience, the interface, the infrastructure, the finance scope, the arbitration, the governance security, all of them scope frameworks. Um, great. We can go now for, um, for next slide, the core unit budgets. So yes, March is uh, our core unit budget um, submission window. And so many core unit budgets, uh, namely for um, the core unit stack ops, deco, gov alpha, risk, strategic finance, data insights, and uh, size stream auction services. For the other section of the core unit framework, uh, there are the facilitators and mandates subproposals. Um, so there is an onboarding proposal for NIC O uh, for collateral engineering services. And then for the freshly posted proposals, we have two facilitator onboardings and two facilitator offboardings. So first, uh, it, uh, there are two for the protocol engineering core unit. So a voluntary, voluntary offboarding from Derek to be replaced by the onboarding of the entity Pro, uh, Prototech Labs LLC, which is represented by Derek himself. And second, Primoz is stepping out uh, as a facilitator of the risk core unit. I'm proposing to onboard the entity BA Labs LLC, which will be represented by Rema and Money Supply. These sub proposals are all con are contingent on the um, newly proposed amendment, um, which is MIP 4C2 sub proposal 34, that aims to amend MIP 41. So uh, to expand the notion of facilitator and make uh, entities um, uh, possible facilitators. Uh, so this amendment is listed on the next slide. But before we do that, um, just uh, uh, um, so. If the amendment doesn't pass, there's a REMA and money supply. Um, they are being uh, proposed as co-facilitators for the risk core unit. And finally, there is this uh, the core unit mandate modification proposal for SAS core unit. So here we are on the uh, final slide of the uh, proposals in RFC. There are two core unit budget extensions for SAS and tech ops through MIP 14 uh, subproposals, so a simple die transfer, and two special purpose funds related to MIP um, 116, so D3M to Sparkland, which we just introduced. One is a, a 50,000 die uh, fund for legal and incorporation expenses for Phoenix Labs, and the other one is 347 and 100 die for all expenses to launch uh, Sparkland and maintain it for a year. Um, and finally, the amendment we just mentioned. So they want to include entities as possible core unit facilitators. 
Okay. So um, for important dates, um, remember that the ratification polls start on Monday and will run for two weeks. Uh, we will do, as usual, a weekly update on the forum. So written, a written one uh, where we will make sure to list all of uh, this information. So you can go take a look um, on Monday. Uh, um, and then the frozen period. Uh, for the proposals entering the March governance cycle, uh, it starts on March the 2nd, uh, so it's a third, Thursday at 0 um, a.m. UTC, so Wednesday midnight UTC. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Huge. Thanks, Gala. That was uh, quite the update. Uh, obviously, that's all in written form as well uh, on, on the forum. Definitely suggest checking that out as it will link to all the proposals uh, individually, help you keep track of them a little bit easier. Um, but yeah, as you might have guessed, this is going to be a, a pretty crazy month for requests for comments. Uh, if you're a voter or a delegate or the type of person that, that normally leaves comments on uh, proposals, um, would kind of offer a huge encouragement to maybe start that as early as possible this month. Um, there's a lot of stuff to get through. And I know uh, several people have come to GovAlpha a little worried that their proposal might end up taking a back seat just because there are so many others for consideration. So um, I think collectively we can, we can kind of combat that by by starting earlier and, and getting feedback uh, as soon as possible to, to the people that took the time to submit. <laughs> yeah, we'll drop a link for you out as that. <laughs> Um, cool. Uh, so yeah, that was a, a long little bit. Uh, I did want to pause out and do uh, a little bit of a, a, a check-in uh, moment here, a chance for us to pause before going into our initiative update and, and hearing about the 2022 financials. Um, we're going to take like 30 seconds of think time after I speak here, uh, but I'm curious if the group could think of some metaphors uh, that they would use to describe uh, this GNR call in, in particular. So uh, as a reminder, like uh, simile is saying, uh, you know, X is like Y, uh, a metaphor is saying X is Y. Um, so it's kind of the idea of like, what's something that could personify this, this group of people joining the GNR. Um, so take a few seconds to think, and then about 30 seconds, I'll have anyone who thought of one drop it in the chat and we can uh, laugh together at uh, some of the metaphors for what a GNR call is, is actually like. But 30 seconds, come up with a metaphor. What is this group? What is the GNR uh, actually? All right, I'm going to start reading these off in about five seconds here. So if you can think of any other clever metaphors, uh, please do drop them in the group. All right, so we got Gala falling back on that previous metaphor of uh, GNR is a tornado, uh, especially on weeks like this with the MIPS update. <laughs> got Kianga dropping uh, what I'm assuming is an alien emoji, uh, also a, a pretty fitting metaphor. <laughs> Raphael with Simile, this GNR is like a cocktail with some soda in it. <laughs> Excited to hear the uh, follow up to that line. And Juan says if he only spend, had one hour left to, on Earth, he, he would spend it here on the GNR, which is really sweet if you ignore his last sentence. <laughs> and as Adrian says, we're, we're all really here for the stamps. So uh, <laughs> appreciate you guys taking that little indulgence, helps us activate, stay focused. Um, now we are going to shift into our initiative updates. Like I said, uh, we have a really cool uh, report from the strategic finance guys uh, to talk about. Um, so I would appreciate your attention now that we've all kind of focused in and, and had a moment to uh, engage. So uh, I believe uh, it is even you, Adrian, who, who's going to talk. Is that right? Yeah, I sent you a link on the chat. OK, uh, awesome. First slides. Give to everyone on the chat. Second to rotate here. Wish I oh, knew share. I see all the anonymous animals. Sure. <laughs> Apparently, I can share like multiple things at once. We're not going to try that today. We'll keep it simple, but maybe in the future. 
Okay, this looks like something that's supposed to happen. Yes. Take it away, Adrian. So in the next slide, just inviting everyone to read through the disclaimer at their leisure, unless uh, you, Rose, you want to read through this carefully for the next 45 minutes. Then on the next slide. Um, so overall, what we're going to do is, is go through like five slides with sort of key highlights from the end of your report, but then try to turn over as much time as possible to people if they have any comments or questions. Uh, because all of this information is essentially in, in that report, but I think it's worthwhile if anyone has any sort of doubts or comments or whatever to sort of ask them here. Um, so the 2022 year closed at a positive net operating earnings level. However, much declined from the year before, both in terms of net revenues and in terms of increase in operating expenses. And there are two major features here. A growing share of assets are allocated to real world assets. And our net interest margin and our return on assets is still largely unoptimized because we have a very large PSM that continues to earn 0%, which may or may, or may not be intentional depending on governance decisions. In the next slide, it's important to keep track of the balance sheet, probably as the first uh, point of order, given this is a balance sheet driven sort of protocol. Relative to 20, 2021, MakerDAO has compressed and seen the size of its balance sheet compressed significantly. However, we've fortunately also seen an increase in the size of the surplus buffer, albeit it still remains reasonably thinly capitalized, which is probably okay for a balance sheet that's mostly composed of over collateralized crypto vaults. But as there's a significant portion of real world assets on the balance sheet, we should continue encouraging governance to increase the surplus buffer as a priority to buffer against the risks that are inherent to these folks. If you look at the, the way to read this balance sheet is assets equals liabilities and equity, where it die circulating die represents a, li a quote unquote liability for the protocol that can in turn be invested on the asset side. And the aim here should be to generally earn more on the assets than what the capital structure costs on the liabilities and the equity side. And at the bottom, you can see the reconciliation that takes you from net operating earnings, which is more so from the operations of the protocol, past all of the other changes, including sort of mints and burns, to the net change in the, the surplus buffer, which is a positive, positive 10 million relative to last year. In the next slide here, we show both the significant reduction in the size of the balance sheet, which peaked at $10 billion and is currently at sort of five. And also the change in its composition, which if you look at the yellow piece, the RWAs, this represents the sort of biggest percentage increase and represents a substantial portion of our balance sheet. On the next slide. A similar story in revenue, so, so both with the compression of the size of the balance sheet and with the allocation to assets that are earning a positive net interest margin, the revenues have dramatically decreased. I will sort of note that this particular chart is showing gross revenues, both, so first of all, gross revenues and second of all, pro forma. So these are not on-chain revenues. This is just an illustration of what the gross revenues would look like if we recognize them on chain in our uh, in our consolidated accounting we do not do this so until revenues return to the surplus buffer we do not count them but we figured it would be useful nonetheless to show a pro forma view of what it would look like if you included all of the on-chain components in the next slide Focusing briefly on asset liability management, there's two charts that are worth studying uh, in this section. On the first one, on the liquidity side, the way to interpret this is to look at the amount of uh, of liabilities with the red in the in the sort of red color, and their allocation relative to the um, to the 
let's call it effective maturity of those liabilities. In other words, the time that it takes for the die to be redeemed. You have it organized by day, week, month, and year. And this is a behavioral view of what dies circulation looks like. And on the asset side, you have a view of what the what the sort of effective duration of those invested assets looks like. And the comparison between the two gives you essentially the sort of gap between the two. And if you see, we're well over indexed on the day block because we have a very large portion allocated to the PSM. However, most of our die tends to circulate for more than a year. So there's a liquidity gap here, which is creating this sort of drag on the return of assets. And although this might be reasonable from a sort of liquidity prioritization perspective, the reality is that continu a continuing allocation of over 70% of stablecoins is probably still in itself reasonably risky. And as we've seen by numerous community voices with respect to GUSD or uh, you know, the risk of USDC blacklisting the PSM, being in stablecoins doesn't necessarily mean it's risk-free. And then on the final slide, I just wanted to uh, call out the insane amount of work that Lit has done uh, to put together the, the make, what we're starting to call the maker gap, which we believe is the first on-chain double entry accounting ledger for a pure crypto protocol. We've developed a fully mapped chart of accounts. It's available as a June spell. It's queryable by anyone. And it's on GitHub, so you know you can anyone can submit PRs to to to, to modify it. And the cool feature about this is that these financials are built bottom up from every single individual transaction, which means that every single period is auditable down to the individual transaction linked. And this is an in this took a lot of work to put together. It's a work in progress and ongoing with the ongoing uh, sort of work needed to classify things in different ways. People might have disagreements on, on how to do things, for example. But what we propose here is, so one thing that we've noticed is that there are, let's say, research houses and let's say commercial firms that have used our queries and our work in the past. Uh, and they've often they've often done so with minimal attribution, occasionally with outright plagiarism. And so, in this case, we ask kindly that if anyone does use MakerGap for commercial purposes, in other words, selling it or producing a report and then selling that report or selling a subscription or enterprise plan for a subscription or something similar, that they pay a share of that revenue to the Maker Post proxy in return. So that's that's it. That's the whole license. Um, or Kianga will find it. And then the final, and that's it. And I, I think on the last page, we left a link to the forum post that contains the entire contents of the financial report. It's a very dense read. Um, I think if you're interested in, in the sort of technicalities of sort of fake or balance sheet businesses, you might find it interesting. Uh, so yeah, and I think it'd be good to open it up for questions. So maker gap. The, the classification can be updated. In other words, whether a transaction fits into one place or another. So if there's a new type of vault, we would need to allocate it to the correct or map it to the correct chart of accounts. If Maker didn't change, it would just continue running and, and populating the way it is. But I think we've given it enough sort of logic to the existing rules that we have a pretty good idea of where things should go. And yeah, sorry guys, if there's a lot of background noise, but I'm in a coffee shop and it's very noisy. So uh, apologies for that. I appreciate you making the time for us. And yeah, uh, we did allocate like another 10, 15 minutes-ish for questions if we do have them. Um, so I will put out a call for people. Um, I guess I can uh, kind of start with one is like, uh, how periodically do you think you'll be releasing uh, updates to to this? Uh, I don't know what to even call it, like software or um, framework. Oh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a June query, right? So anyone can read it and we're regularly sort of pruning it and making sure that all of the accounts are correct and stuff. And I think the one bit that's manual as it is pointing out is the the Power BI data model, but we're, we're in touch with June and we're pushing them to integrate this directly in June, for example, which would be ideal. If not to at least have them automation to make the extraction of this data model. Automatically. Yeah. 
Yeah, did you have something, uh, August? No worries, if not, I just saw the unmute. Yeah, I, I got a actually a question on the last slide there. Um, not too familiar with, uh, well, obviously I know gap accounting, but um, so double entry, I guess you're separating the debits and the credits and then you're, um, how, do, how does this differ? Why is it advantageous to use double entry as opposed to single entry? Um, is it because of the way maker works with uh, the debt that, it, that folks take when they open up a vault? Can you kind of walk us through that? Sure. Sorry. So, I mean, what we tried to do was stick to a well-established method of accounting that basically puts every change in a transaction in two separate places so that both sides of the balance sheet are constantly, let's say, in balance. There's no, it's not that it's specific to banking or lending or anything like it. It's just that this is sort of widely recognizable common practice that originated like thousands and thousands of years ago. Maybe not thousands of years ago. I don't know my account history so long. But the point is, this is a format that's that works, that is widely understood by professionals in many fields, and can hopefully help popularize and divulge the 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 fundamental economics in a in a in a broader way than just sort of reporting blockchain data. Thanks, Pedro. So I've got a comment from Wilder here that I think might be a little interesting potentially for some discussion saying, I'd love to understand if it makes sense to integrate this with the expenses dashboard and what that might look like. Could be as simple as putting links in the right places so people find what they're looking for. Um, yeah, we, if you have a comment on that, you can, Adrian, but I'm also curious um, just generally like how in terms of the actual expense data, like um, you mentioned you're grabbing on-chain things. So uh, just... Does your data match up with the uh, expense website or are there some discrepancies there? So it shouldn't match to the reported data. We're taking a very conservative thin protocol view where anything that leaves the protocol has left for good. And if it returns, it's a negative expense as it were. So when you see workforce expenses, there's no dis there's no sort of further discrimination into four units or anything like it. Uh, so we're taking delegate compensations, SPFs, uh, you know, one-time transfers, core unit disbursements, all that sort of stuff. Anything that's outside of the protocol is basically gone. And I think that's the most conservative possible view that you could take. Um, and then conversely, if there's a, a sort of DSS blow, then it shows up as a sort of negative expense in the reversal. But yeah, we didn't see we didn't see it necessarily as super value adding because a lot of core units tend to do things like pull out three months worth of expenses. And if you look at it from this sort of cash accounting point of view, it looks like a core unit has a has like a big spend in one month and then no spend in the subsequent months, which is not necessarily the case. The idea of this is not to do management accounting on a core unit level, but to show the overall protocol economics. I think, yeah, the, the expense dashboard, from what I understand, is basically reported expenses in, and categorized on a self-reported way, which is, I think, would go beyond the scope of what we're trying to achieve here. Yeah, Wilder, I don't know if you're uh, near Mike, but uh, Kiango is kind of wondering uh, what, what your process is and, and kind of the comparison there. Yes, I, I can talk about that. So um, with the expenses dashboard, we kind of... Uh, built it up uh, like a bottom up first right so we we first made sure that we we can uh, collect all the reports from the core units and um so since last year we we have all the core units onboarded we have this uh, uh continuous reporting going on and um i think uh adrian put it clearly so I, what is a single line item or maybe a few line items in the in the gap model that we see here is basically uh, detailed and specified in uh, 
today's version of the expenses dashboard, and then will and that will be improved uh, in the future. Um, specifically to the point of uh, on-chain versus uh, reported expenses. So this is something that we have in the pipeline. Um, as I said, we start bottom up uh, with the reported expenses. But one of our uh, features in the pipeline is that we will then match it with the the on-chain uh, money flows. So one of the things that we're um, we're bridging is um, exactly what was mentioned. So the, the fact that, for example, uh, uh, three months of expenses are taken out uh, to uh, uh, to give a, a runway to core units, and that's why the numbers today. Uh, don't match up yet. So if, for example, there is 1 million leaving the protocol, then you will not immediately see that 1 million in spending because it's sitting first a uh, couple of months in um, uh, in, in the yeah, the auditor multi-sigs and then the operational multi and then, then it is spent. So this, this period in between um, is where we will merge the on-chain data with the reported expenses, and um, yeah, one of our KPIs is to to reduce that gap to zero, so that we have we have the, the numbers uh, completely adding up, and then to um, yes, indeed, with the uh, with the great help of the data insights core unit, so we will be using the uh, the, the API that the data insights core unit is providing to fetch the on chain data. Um, and then uh, yeah, I want to keep it short because uh, this is supposed to be about, about the gap, not about the expenses effort. But um, the last thing I want to say is that um, the the other thing that we'll be working on in the future is that is that link that Kianga is, is talking about. Um, so from from MIP proposal to expense what is the money being spent on, not just in terms of uh, accounting categories such as benefits, but what projects is the money being spent on, which of course touches on the uh, project-based budgeting um, framework that we we are working to, uh, to prepare. So, and that's basically where it all comes together. So um, the expense reports that the core units are submitting today, um, they will be enriched with uh, the specific project that the, the expenses are for. And then you'll you'll have the full picture of um, the on-chain versus the reported expenses, and not just in terms of the accounting categories, but also in terms of the projects that the money is spent on. So that's uh, yeah, that's practically the main focus of our roadmap today. Yeah, this is honestly pretty cool to see how like a uh, you know a source on on the expense dashboard, which is. Uh, Kind of self-attested, right? It's it's up to facilitators to join and participate, versus one that is just on chain. Like uh, how those two uh, data sources are individually useful, and then even more useful when you when you start to combine them together. So that is a, a good line of questioning, and appreciate you taking the moment to explain it better. Adrian, how, how much um, RWA off-chain revenue is missing from, let's say, going back to June, when the market completely flopped, uh, is it is it significant or or irrelevant that you can't fit it in there? No, it's almost none. Uh, the biggest month is December with about three million from what we counted. Okay. Because the the RWAs took a while to to wind up, right? Uh, they only really wound up. There were, I mean, there was there were what we sort of call the pioneer vaults, but they didn't generate a lot of off chain revenue. The really significant ones that started to come online were HVB, which only really sort of came online in like October. And they took a while to start drawing it down. I think they're not fully invested yet either. I mean, you'd have to refer to Ruse reporting. MIP65 is indeed the, the big money maker, and it was only sort of fully online a little bit later. So yeah, we in, comparing, in comparing those legacy RWA vaults to decentralized collaterals that exclude WBTC and ETH and stake ETH, et cetera, you know, the, the main components of DeFi. What, what, how do you compare that? Like the legacy vaults or WAs to the manas and yearns of the world? Is it similar? 
Are they both struggling? I mean, obviously they are, but can you kind of give us color there? Sorry, I, I, I didn't quite follow the question. You wanted more detail on the crypto platform. Yeah, comparison between the legacy RWA votes versus the legacy, or I don't know if they're legacy, the smaller votes that probably don't add much to the balance sheet uh, outside of B WBTC and ETH. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, they're both quite small. I presume the legacy RWA votes probably cost a little bit more. So when you think about it in terms of the up of the upkeep for having an Oracle, uh, I mean, there are there are a handful of votes that are money losing, quote unquote, just because of the Oracle upkeep, but not that many. I would imagine, I would imagine it's different for the RWA votes, the legacy ones. Though, yeah, I mean, now we're wading into Rue territory. I'd rather let him answer that. And I think he's gone into detail in some of them in his latest report. So I think the bottom line is I, I expect them to be more expensive to run than the smaller crypto votes. Uh, but yeah, I guess it depends on how invested it is. Sounds like I might be able to rip through into a future obligation then. Uh, this has been uh, really great, Adrian. Uh, any final thoughts, uh, big takeaways that you kind of want the DAO to, to get from this? Make your gap is thin protocol view only. Yeah, that's a pretty important one. I'll let everyone read the other. All right. Well, uh, huge thanks again, AJ, and uh, to the strategic finance team and, and everyone who came together to uh, both put the report and the presentation uh, available for us. All right. Uh, that was another kind of beefy section. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Gala to bring us back in with a little energizer. E yes, here I am. So yeah, we're doing an energizer to try to just um, have some fun before we dive into the deeper conversations and discussions that we have. So we are playing a, a game. Um, so I trust that you are going to be able to follow two uh, main um, points, these instructions. One is to listen carefully and the other one is to not take any notes. Um, so let's go ahead. I'll ask you to please listen carefully to the following. Closely, teeth, highest, play, radio, traditional, deep, independence, attend, situation, breakfast, economy, box, level, plenty, song, surround, operator, refuse. Now, um, I will ask you to write in the chat... Um, <laughs> was not in the chat box uh, all of the words you can remember and do not type send yet so i will give you like one minute to write down the, the words you might remember not even one minute i don't want to talk too much because I forgot already all of them for sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay well when you're ready send it <laughs> radio come on not a good game we're recording from <laughs> nice i like knew it was coming and there was still only four i could remember for sure you actually said <laughs> Well, that was interesting for those who participated. Breakfast was there for sure. Surround operator refused. That was nice, Tiago. <laughs> Radio was there. It was totally. <laughs> you could have uh, remember breakfast. Well, that was awesome. I hope you enjoyed it. That was my energizer for the day. And yeah, pros, you can go ahead to introduce the next part. All right. Um, huge thanks, Gala. Um, there's a chance when I hit this button, everything's going to break. So I'm just going to click it now rather than when I need it. Cool. Nothing broke. Don't you love it when that happens? All right. I'm going to re-share my screen here so you guys can see what's going on. Um, and we'll move into our breakout activity. Appreciate the patience here while you watch me struggle with technology.
Yeah, that looks like the thing I want to show you. Okay, cool. So uh, in case you didn't get any of the hints from me not saying much at the start or on the forum, uh, we're going to be trying something a, a little different today. Uh, calling this like a pregame breakout session. Um, going to take a little bit of trust, uh, but we'll call it an extension of credit and keep on rolling. So uh, the object of this is really just to try to get more voices in governance, try to get more people feeling um, like they have both the space uh, and the influence to participate in, in the conversations we're having. Um, obviously, one of the biggest conversations we're having is around the in-game constitution. Um, it being kind of a, a proposal to really uh, fix some of the shortcomings of our uh, current iteration of, of the protocol. Um, so my goal today is to kind of have us break out into a few different groups where we can talk about a specific su a subject. It's going to be four different subjects, which gives us a chance to hopefully go to a room uh, that we want to participate, or at least we want to uh, listen in on and then hear um, the awesome discussion happening. Uh, but we're going to be trying to answer the same three questions. Uh, that way, after we take 15 minutes, uh, discuss them in these small groups and come back, uh, we can do a brief presentation from each group and, and try to hear like kind of what some of the voices out there in the community um, are about. So um, just real briefly in terms of what uh, those three questions are going to be, we want to hear what are some of the shortcomings uh, in, in the domain group you're going into currently. How does in-game propose addressing some of those shortcomings? And where might uh, there still be gaps uh, where, where in-game maybe isn't addressing them? Um, so as you can see, hopefully this is a productive way for uh, you to engage and, and talk and, and get some ideas on paper that we'll then post to the forum um, and other people can, can learn and, and engage with as well. Uh, so you're probably wondering, okay, four groups, that sounds easy enough, but do well, I actually want to talk about any of the groups? Uh, let's hope so. Uh, so for group number one, uh, a big group point of the in-game, um, pre-game constitution rather, is this uh, easy governance front end. So uh, group number one is going to be talking about the voter interface. Currently, this is the voting portal where uh, voting, delegation, uh, all that stuff currently takes place and where some more things are planned to take place in in-game. Uh, I've got some warm-up questions listed there on the screen. Uh, these are going to be in the actual planning doc, um, but these questions are more to just see if this is like the type of group you might want to engage in. So voter interface group, like a starting point for them, uh, the like brain teasers, you know, why is it important for MKR holders to be able to vote? Uh, what are some things making it harder? What risks uh, are, are incurred by having a, a dedicated front end? Who are the users and how will that shift in in-game? And who are the maintainers now in an in-game? So if those starting points sound interesting, you, you might be interested in group one, which is voter interface. If not, uh, here's group two called accountability mechanisms. Um, this one is going to be a bit harder in terms of the DAO and present because they're spread out against a bunch of other processes. Um, but in terms of the in-game constitution, it focuses on constitutional conservers. Um, so you might be interested in this group um, if your starting point is like, uh, how do we know things are going according to um, how they're invoted? Uh, what enforcement or accountability mechanisms exist today? What are some examples of uh, that are not being uh, good accountability in the DAO? Who are we providing this accountability for? And how does the philosophy of in-game differ with the status quo when it goes to how we hold people accountable? So again, that's group two, accountability mechanisms. Um, basically, if you're thinking of like, how do we do the thing we said we're going to do, uh, group two is going to be pretty good for you. Uh, Next up, we have delegation and group three um, should be pretty straightforward, but this is the actual uh, governance design of delegation. So different from group one in that you're not talking about the method of, um, of actually submitting your votes, uh, but rather the organization of, of delegation. So currently we have shadow and recognized delegates. Um, and in game, we're gonna have like constitutional voter committees and constitutional delegates. Uh, so you might be interested in working in this breakout group uh if you're interested by by the starting off points of what have uh what dangers are enabled by having a delegation program uh, what do mkr holders gain from it what do you remember being particularly bumpy about maker delegation 
And how are the delegates going to pay? Uh, yeah, uh, so I guess I didn't really address that. So thanks for asking the question, Rhonda. <laughs> I will be mostly letting people self-select. So once I'm done presenting these groups, I'll give a quick recap of what they were for those with short-term memory. I'll have you guys uh, drop in. Uh, chat in terms of the number group that you might be interested in joining. And then I'm going to try to put people in <laughs> somewhat evenly as possible. Um, so it, it is up to you guys. Uh, my hope is that you'll go to the group that you find the most spark in. Uh, and then finally, we have group four, which is service providers. Um, so these are the ecosystem actors, the professional actors uh, in the in game constitution. Um, but they're kind of like core units. They're kind of uh, contractors. They're they're a lot of different things in in the present uh, version of the game. So uh, some warmer questions that might be good if you're interested in in group four mm -hmm. is what are some examples of service providers currently? How are they funded? What dangers exist when you're uh, contracting third parties? And what domains might we uh, particularly need service providers in? Cool. Um, so like I said, those are the four groups, um, group one is going to be voter interface, group two, accountability mechanisms, group three, delegation, and group four, service providers. Um, so now what I'm going to ask you guys to do is to start dropping in numbers in chat. Um, and I will slowly start assigning us to breakout rooms. Um, and then once we get everyone in a breakout room, we're going to give these questions a go for about 15 minutes with uh, a couple of us hopping in to help out in case there's any questions. Uh, and then we'll reconvene um, to, to give a presentation. So most importantly, once you get in groups, the first thing you're going to want to do is uh, pick a spokesperson or spokespersons that'll help give your presentation when you come back to the group. And um, yeah, we'll be popping in to remind you of that. But uh, good good place to start. So I'm going to look very stressed out while I try to deal with technology here. Gal is going to give you a few final reminders uh, as I start sending people out into groups. Yes, <laughs> here I am. I was putting um, in the chat the working docs for each group as well. So let me just pull up the delegation one. Um, So yes, what uh, while Peyton does the breakouts, um, the idea here is uh, well. First of all, I want to remind you if you're planning, we were if you were planning to witness the call without really act, uh, participating actively, feel free to do it <laughs> uh, during the breakout discussions too. You can listen and yeah. Um, so the discussions aim to dive deeper uh, into each discussion point um, by addressing this main uh, like lines so first what are makers current challenges how do you think endgame addresses them and three is uh, does endgame have any blind spots um, on any of these issues how can they be addressed yes i know that they are missing i'll be there soon about her. um so i'll add the groups um we encourage you to have fun to uh, listen actively and participate as much as you want. And I'll be there with the remaining two groups. I don't know how I don't get to copy this. All right. Uh, we don't have a ton of people in group one. So if group one, which is on the screen right now and sounds interesting, feel free to drop a one. I'm trying to spread these out where I can. Um, but just know <laughs> we're slowly getting people in the rooms and I appreciate your patience here. You want to talk over the mic and make fun of me while I do things? That's uh, acceptable. I'll just cut it from the recording. <laughs> so all the working docs should be there on the chat. Please let me know if you need any of them. So for groups one, two, four. Okay, and if you don't have a preference, you can drop a question mark or whatever, and I can freely assign you. Um, but yeah, if you do have preferences, again, group one is voter interface, group two, accountability mechanism, group three, delegation, and group four, those service providers.
Thank you for those reposting yours. <laughs> Nice. It's actually really easy to move. Uh, group three is delegation one. Realizing next time I should end on a slide that has all four of them on the same page. So I'll repeat them. It's a voter interface, group one, accountability mechanisms, group two, delegation is group three, and service providers, it's group four. Uh, that's a good question. I tried to send people to the rooms and it didn't seem to work. So your first choice was two Kianga. Uh, Co-hosts, are you able to do these things as well? I think I am. I'll okay, if you want to help out, you can. We got some people in rooms, but not too many at the moment. It's a little unfortunate. Get in room one. By the uh, way, you me? could self you could self join a breakout room. I just realized if you click breakout room, you could just click on the one that you want to join and join it. That's insanely helpful. Thank you for sharing, David. <laughs> so yeah, you're... so at the bottom of your of your Zoom, you would be able to see the breakout rooms and join the the actual room. Yeah, oh, that's it. causing people to help. Oh, I see it. Because for whatever reason, it keeps switching on my interface and is quite annoying. Problem when you do tests with like four people, it's pretty easy compared to 50. But hey. So not a lot of people in voter interface still. If anyone interested in that group. If not, I might just send some of you in there. All right, um, Gal, it's probably good to start hopping in rooms. Um, I think we can, I can handle the rest from here. Okay, I will. Much obliged. Paper, you feeling like talking today? All right, I'm pretty sure only eight of you can hear me. Is that true? Yep. Good. <laughs> Do any of the eight of you want to go to a particular room? I'm about to. I was just trying to see if someone, the eight are completely. Oh, paper said meh. Paper, I'll just throw you randomly to the room. I think it's the most boring. <laughs> How about you, Brian? I feel like. I feel like accountability mechanisms you could probably do well in, but <laughs> that's fair. Is there anyone you'd want to listen to the doing of governance? All right. Well, um, I'm going to assume that if you're in this room, you probably want to be in this room. Uh, you have the ability to hop into those others, and I would encourage you to do so. Uh, otherwise, uh, we'll be back here in about 10-ish minutes um, to, to give our presentations. So thanks, folks. Hello, everyone in group two. I'm popping in to give you a link to the working doc. Um, hope you have fun <laughs> discussing. And, um, and by the end, you can choose uh, one one person of the group to present uh, your discoveries. If you need anything, uh, 
reach out and I will, I'll be coming back as a silent witness. So have fun. <laughs> All right. Uh, huge apologies if anyone was cut off uh, mid huge uh, realization or <laughs> implementation details. Uh, How could but, you, Peyton? <laughs> yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I uh, did it on purpose. Uh, just kidding. Welcome back to the main room. Uh, hopefully you had a somewhat productive and engaging breakout session. Uh, we did get to buff around to some of the groups. It seemed like they're, for the most part, pretty good conversations going on. Um, so we're going to take the last 15 minutes of the call to kind of regroup here, um, here at least from every group. And uh, we'll, I was hoping for five minutes each. It's probably going to have to be about three minutes each to fit time in. Um, it also seems like maybe that's okay. So uh, I know we had some debate in, in the first group. Uh, Tiago, are you just going to have to fall on the sword and, and tell us what we talked about? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, so yeah, definitely. So yeah, so our group was the, the, the Z governance front end. So um, the questions, uh, her prompts were, uh, first one, why is, why is it important for anchor holders to be able to vote? Uh, as Peyton pointed out, it will be a DAO if you'll not be able to, to vote. Um, and this, yeah, it's also quite important to, to vote to contribute to the security of the, the maker protocol. So those are things that stand out. The second question, uh, what are some, uh, some of the things, uh, making it hard, harder to vote at the moment? Um, so as yeah, as Nadia points out, uh, we have too many pro proposals, and uh, some of them are quite complex. Um, some are quite complex uh, in terms of in technical terms, so you need almost to be a, a developer to understand those proposals. Um, gas costs was um, was making it hard to vote uh, with yeah, solve that with a bit with the. Gasless voting in the voting portal. We need to see how that uh, plays out in the in the end game context. The third questions were what what risks are introduced by having a dedicated uh, front end. Um, so things that stand out in our talk were, of course, having attempts of uh, manipulation. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, random delegation and. Uh, how important it is to onboard um, MKR holders and uh, make sure that when they delegate, they, they make an informed decision and that delegation aligns with their, with their values. Um, the other question uh, was, uh, who are the users now and later on in the game? Um, of course, now our users are, are very much um, they're knowledgeable about the, the micro protocol. So, uh, of course, we have die holders and MKR holders, but with the end, the end game context, uh, you might uh, be having new users, more retail users who are motivated to buy small amounts of MKR. Uh, and of course, that uh, uh, we need to end hold those users and try to onboard, it, onboard them as, as easy as possible. Um, into now into our ecosystem. Uh, the yeah, final question we actually didn't talk too much, but I can talk on behalf of Dex. So the last question was, who are the maintainers now, and how will that shift in the in game? Uh, from the technical point of view, I guess Dex Core Unit that stands for Development in UX. I guess we are the the, man, the maintainers. Um, Sub DAOs will be the maintainers. The, the centralized front ends. Now they point out uh, also is important to incentivize um, other front ends to exist. So we have uh, um, yeah, multiple um, uh, front ends where, where uh, those decisions can uh, can be made. We we have actually POC of having a, a light version uh, that that we could run in case uh, we had some issue with our main portal. Um, yeah, so these were some of the things we happily debate. I mean, uh, Nadia had something to to have. I thought you gave a pretty comprehensive overview, Tiago. Appreciate it. Um, 
we get a chance, we might come back and talk about like maybe some of the the gaps in in game. But I do want to make sure we hear from uh, from all our groups first. So uh, let's move on to group two first uh, for a second. Uh, who's represented from group two? And do you want to tell us kind of uh, about the gaps and, and shortcomings you were talking about? And group two was accountability. David, I think David is good. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll kick it off and then Raphael, Kianga, and David could add to it. But real quickly, not taking up too much time. Uh, first question was, how do we know everything is going to according to plan? And um, we didn't digest that as much as we should have. But I, from my point of view, I think we probably want to measure the progress of the rollout of clusters, uh, whether that's per month, per voting cycle. Who knows? As Today, and this will be focused on mostly, uh, obviously right now there isn't any accountability. Um, most of the MCARE token owners, well, all of the M MCARE token owners don't have an insight to what's going on. As far as every core unit is concerned, we don't have an insight. Um, even though there are some core units who diligently post every month, uh, you know, their, their, their doings every single month, reports, et cetera. Uh, as far as enforcement, the only thing that uh, is possibly being done right now is uh, defunding some of these core units, right? If they're not performing up to par or uh, in the opinion of MKR token owners and delegates alike, they feel that it's not necessary anymore because of the rollout of the end game. And then there was the some examples of situations of lack of oversight. I think we got into more like when the end game, the maker constitution is passed and the end game is rolled out, like what are the things that you know, how can you have accountability and enforcement? And one of the things that we discussed was that in the end game, as an example, someone like Spark Lend, they have a duty to hire a third party that could be to a DLO, it could be through project based funding, somebody like a front end developer. And if that front end developer doesn't develop, doesn't deliver in time, that pretty much sets back the entire Spark Lend team. And then the Sparkle and team has accountability because uh, as we see the end game, it's pretty much a revenue sharing thing where Sparkle Len could possibly benefit from more users using that front end, right? So if the front end is not being delivered, then it has to hold the, um, the, 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 the Ducks team developer, as an example, in the same Ducks, but the developer, they have the front end developer there to, uh, to deliver on time. I don't know if you want to add anything else there, or Kianga or Raphael or David. I'll just very quickly say we were also just talking about the human, um, the manpower, woman power, person power required to operate the end game and who's that going to be? And, you know, what are the trade-offs, cost benefit incentives for people to devote the kind of time needed to understand it, build it, work it, um, and what those some of those challenges may be, constitutional interpretation. Does there need to be a separate body that interprets, you know, separate from the accountability of just sort of enforcing, do people do what they say they're going to do? I appreciate it, group two. Again, uh, plenty of questions I could ask, but let's try to make sure we at least hear from all the groups first. Uh, let's see what group three has for us. Okay, I can uh, speak out for group three. Um, we were asked, what are the pain points and problems with makers current implementation on delegates and delegation? Um, we identified three, um, free riding, um, apathy from maker holders, and a particular one being annual contract expirations. Um, with free riding, it's just anyone can be a delegate and just kind of vote randomly. And because there's not a lot of oversight, there's, there's no one really stopping you from doing that and just getting paid and um apathy for maker holders obviously in the lo low percentage of people who are actually delegating and this also ties in with the annual contract expiration where um so con delegate contracts expire after a year and we've seen a lot of times where 
the delegators will take many months to move their MKR holder or might not even do it at all. Um, that creates a problem for the delegates, you know, to get, they're losing that consistent voting power and pay. And how does the end game plan seek to address this? Um, they're, for one, it's supposed to include voter incentives to address apathy. Um, that should at least give MKR holders more incentivization to vote or to delegate because they're getting some sort of pay for it. Um, to address free riding, the CV CVCs are supposed to be kind of looking over the delegates. It's no longer the case, I guess, that you can just get a maker holder to delegate you to you and then you earn funds. You also have to um, get a CVC who's supposed to be more involved. They're supposed to be doing these quarterly reports and meetings to support you. And additionally, there will be, um, you know, constitutional limits on the power of delegates, I guess, to address any, in theory, to address corruption issues, to limit their power to what's prescribed in the constitution. Um, and we were asked, uh, last was, where are there gaps to be filled and ideas to address this? Um, we noted there's, I guess, a lot of concern over corruption, like how do we stop delegates or for CVCs from being corrupt or colluding? And um, an unanswered question is how are delegates onboarded and offboarded with these CVCs? It's, it's not at all explained. So um, that was our overview. <laughs> Yeah, that's quite the overview. That's uh, you guys really covered uh, a lot of the pain points that uh, at least I've been hearing in, in my DMs. So that's quite exciting for for me to hear, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to build off of that further. Um, without rushing us along too much, I do want to hear from our last group uh, before we close out. So I'll pass off the mic for Group Four. Hear what you were working on. I would be service providers and collectively, I'm sure people are saying the person we thought was going to talk isn't speaking up, <laughs> which can happen in the most numerous group. <laughs> Who wants to tell me what happened in the, the service provider chat? I guess I can speak since no one else is speaking. <laughs> um, but essentially, I think there's like a few things we discussed. Uh, one of which that's pretty important is um, how are service system or service uh, providers, ecosystem actors held accountable? I think right now in DAOs, it's you're seeing a variety of different approaches by uh, various DAOs across the ecosystem, and uh, I think one thing is for sure uh, among the varied approaches is, is this is kind of like an unsolved problem because, you know, you, you basically have to rely on token holders to be experts in various different you know, subject um, areas, you know, from engineering to accounting to, you know, uh, security um, to marketing. You know, it, it's quite a big ask to, you know, evaluate how effective a service provider is being. And kind of how I think about it from you know finance perspective and from like a steakhouse perspective, which is like the entity that we've created for streak finance. Um, and you know what I'm seeing with other teams more and more across the space, including in our DAO, is that you know you need to have a legal entity to protect your team, and you know ultimately you should be providing services to multiple DAOs. Um, otherwise, it looks like you're just working for one DAO. And I think like, you know, morally and logically that makes sense, but like from a legal perspective, you're putting yourself at risk as, as looking as an employee of that DAO and can be subject to more, uh, legal liability. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, um, it's like a different, difficult situation for contributors and you're seeing, you know, I think in some of the recent budget proposals that people are, you know, posting their entities or offboarding as facilitator and onboarding an entity um, for legal protection ostensibly. Um, so uh, that's just a few other things that we kind of discussed. Awesome, Mark. A lot of uh, insight and wisdom. I think it almost uh, 
<laughs> Got lost to <of> time. <laughs> Appreciate you taking the speaking role. All right. Well, uh, there's a lot of stuff to build on here. Uh, you might have saw in the chat, I spun up a quick forum thread. Uh, if people have notes or anything they produce during those um, calls and they want to drop it in the forum thread so others can access it, uh, that'll be awesome. Um, not entirely expecting that because maybe they were more private notes and that's totally fine too. So I will be kind of reviewing the the tape and, and writing a summary on that page. Um, but what would really make me happy is if uh, we could take some of the, the pain points in particular, service them on that and uh, maybe get a discussion going uh, so we can uh, start this kind of feedback loop of making sure we're, we're all on the same page and, and evaluating the, the same risks. All right, well, uh, been it over time, uh, so I apologize, couldn't quite squeeze it into one GNR, but uh, I do really appreciate you guys taking the ride with me. Uh, we'll be back same time, same place next week for a more regular meeting. Uh, but don't worry, we'll we'll have another uh, breakout session like call uh, before too long here uh, that incorporates some of the lessons learned today to be even a little bit more effective. So thanks everyone for participating. As always, let's keep the conversation going in the forum and on chat. And uh, yeah, pleasure as always. Thanks, guys.